Hi everyone, welcome to another of my Mimax character creation guides for Pillars of Eternity. My name is Maxon. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Druid class. Now, Druids are basically spellcasters. They work in a very similar manner to how wizards and priests work. They do large era of effect attacks in the main via their spells, which do damage to many opponents at one time. So they're basically mob killers. Now, these spells, uh, they focus very much on doing afflictions uh, via Tanglefoot, for example. And also, they have quite a few spells that do elemental damage, like Winter Wind or Sunbeam. They have quite a large variety of spell types, though, much more so than the Wizard. Uh, the Wizard is kind of a mix between damage attacks and uh, more defensive type spells in the main. Uh, so they're much more flexible than wizards and they do a lot more damage spells compared to priests but they also have the odd bit of uh, healing as well like priests do in uh, in this case you can see their nature's figure which is a level one spell now they also have a starting ability which is called spirit shift this allows a druid to basically transform itself into a creature once per combat and you can see here it mentions they have strong melee ability so that creatures usually have claws or teeth to attack opponents with. Uh, you can see here in this case I've picked a spirit shift wolf. Uh, you can pick from any five of these creatures. I'm going to be covering each and every one of these creatures in much more detail later on though so I'm not going to mention too much about them yet. During the course of the game you'll find your druid's role actually changes pretty significantly and this is something I'll mention much more later on when we pick talents. So basically very early on in the game you have, although a certain amount of spells to choose from, it's nowhere near as much as late game. And more importantly, those spells can only be used so many times, they're per rest use. But very late on in the game, the, your spells become per encounter use, so you can use them as many times as you like every combat. Uh, at least the early levels of your spells up to level 3. Uh, at level 9, level 11, and level 13, your spells become per encounter use the first few levels. So at that point, you'll find that you basically use spells and spells alone in combat. Uh, you tend to not use conventional attacks with your druids so much anymore, whereas you do so a lot early on in the game. And also, your spirit shift ability arguably becomes less useful as well. Uh, very early on in the game, it's really amazing, and you frequently want to use it in combat. But later on in the game you have so many spells that maybe it's not so useful. But I'll be mentioning more about that when we pick talents. So moving on to attributes, you can see here that I've created a build that's very much focused on causing a lot of damage in a very quick amount of time. Uh, so it's a DPS build. I don't quite agree with Obsidian star picks though, their star recommendations. Might and Intellect I definitely agree with. These are by far the most important attributes and I'll mention why a bit later on. But Resolve, I really recommend you minimize this stat for most druids. Even though the druids have their spirit shift form, well, they'll be actually engaging in melee combat, where you would think that Resolve is important, and it usually is. I would recommend that you just basically attack opponents that aren't going to attack you back or not attack you uh, very proficiently. Uh, they're very good at taking out archers, for example, or wizards, uh, things that aren't very good in melee. Uh, so that's what I tend to use the spirit shift form on or perhaps in situations where you can attack one opponent with a number of your party members. Resolve is much uh, mainly used for frontline builds, opponents that are going to be attacked and attack frequently. If your druid is being attacked in combat frequently then you're basically playing poorly frankly. You can avoid being attacked with your druid in many if not most circumstances if you're playing well. Uh, so that's why I've completely minimized resolve and I've actually lowered my constitution as well uh, to a certain level to maximize out my other stats. Uh, constitution is more important a stat than it used to be, uh, which I'll mention a bit more about later on. But uh, yeah, I still recommend you not focus on it, particularly with a druid. Now the attributes where I've completely and utterly maxed out are might and intellect. These are by far their most important attributes. Intellect's important for spellcasters. If you're going to be maximizing your mob killing ability with your spells, you need to target as many opponents as possible. That's where area of effect comes in. If you want to do 
damage to your opponents. You need to do damage over as long a time as possible. And also your affliction spells. You also this is also very useful for that. Also, uh, if you want to do damage to your opponents, might is what you need to select. There's no way around that. So you need to maximize your might since you're a mob killer. Uh, the whole point of the druid is to do as much damage as possible, basically. Uh, because intellect is very important, I've actually selected Old Vela as a culture to get an extra intellect there. Uh, you do have the odd healing spell, of course, as well, which uh, might help us out with. The other attributes, perception and dexterity, is pretty difficult to figure out which one is more important. I'd say perception has become much more important since uh, the release of the White March because it's uh, changed. Uh, you actually get accuracy boosts, which is very important for spellcasters. Uh, so you could actually perhaps uh, get rid of a bit, bit of dexterity for perception or even minimize your constitution to raise your perception a bit. But in this circumstance, I've uh, kept dexterity and perception to the same amount. Both of these are damage per second attributes now. Uh, so the higher they are, the more damage you'll be doing to opponents. Many of the spells also have different casting times. That's where dexterity comes in. Very useful as well. So yeah, they're very close in uh, which is more important. Whenever I select a background, I try to pick a background that basically maximizes the skill I want to maximize the most. In this case, I've picked Colonist, which gives a couple of points in survival. And the Druid, of course, starts with a couple of points in survival. So it'll be very easy to level this up to very high levels since we start with an amount of four. I'm going to mention more about skills later on though, when we actually level up our Druid and start to pick some talents. So moving on to race. Uh, the actual race I've selected here or sub-race is the Boreal Dwarf. When you're picking a race, you basically want to have a race that complements the attributes or has a particularly powerful ability. Uh, I want to have an ability in this case that helps me to do damage on opponents. So the Boreal Dwarf actually gives an accuracy boost uh, against a couple of creature types. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best pick for a Druid, but it's a pretty decent one. Uh, the attributes definitely complement it. The extra might I've maximized. And the dexterity, uh, negative amounts and a bonus to constitution doesn't really have an effect on the druid here because I'm not minimizing completely or maximizing completely any of those stats. Uh, if it was uh, extra point in resolve which a human actually gives then that would be pretty bad because I don't want resolve for example. Uh, also their ability isn't all that particularly good for a more of an offensive build. Uh, well, certainly not this one anyway. It only works when you have low endurance. And if we have a low endurance with this character, we probably wouldn't last too long. Uh, you definitely don't want to be targeted for too long with the Druids. Other races that are particularly good and you may want to consider are the Godlike. Uh, they have an extra point in intellect, which is uh, probably the most important attribute. Maybe might. Uh, so that really helps out. An extra point in dexterity as well. Uh, probably the best sub race is the Death God, like it does extra damage to low endurance opponents. Uh, the other sub, sub races, Fire God, likes more of a defensive pick, so I'm not a big fan of that for the Druids, for this Druid build. Moon God, like it's not terrible, but once again, you don't really want to be targeted with the Druids, so I wouldn't really pick that, but it's a way you can get out of jail if you are. Nature God, like. I quite like the look of the nature god, like, but sadly their ability just isn't all that great. Only works when you go below a certain amount of endurance, which uh, is not going to be good for this build at all. And doesn't give you much of a boost either. The half Orlin is a very good uh, sub race that you may want to consider with the Druid. Basically, it uh, has this ability minor threat, so you do extra crits when the Druid targets opponents that someone else within your party is also targeting. I think it's a 10% chance of this happening, although it doesn't mention it here. So remember that you do a lot of area of effect attacks, so you're actually attacking a lot of people at any one time. So you can actually have a decent amount of doing crits, uh, extra crit chance with the Druid. But there are downsides with the Orlin. Uh, basically you get 
an extra point of resolve, which I wouldn't want here since I'm minimizing it. You also have a minus to your might, which you want to maximize, which doesn't help either. So yeah, it's definitely downsides with picking a half all-in with this druid build. Uh, the wild all-in is uh, more of a defensive uh, sub-race, so I wouldn't recommend this for an offensive build like we have here. Uh, elves, you have a couple of sub-races once again. The wood elf is pretty good pick. Uh, you get an extra accuracy boost, deflection and res uh, reflex. Uh, but not all of your spells are have a distance of 4 meters, so it's not always going to work with the druids. Um, most of them do, but certainly not all of them. So it's not a bad pick. Uh, I would actually recommend that to a degree. And uh, also they have a point in dexterity and a point in perception. It's not any of the ones I'm maximizing, but there's certainly... Yeah, uh, you tend to want to pick ones you're maximizing and minimizing. Uh, dwarf, I've mentioned them already. Amawa. This isn't a terrible pick. You get an extra couple of points in might, which is an attribute you probably want to maximize. The actual abilities they give, though, aren't all that amazing. That's best for frontline uh, builds, really, which the druid isn't. That would work when you're using your spirit shift form, of course, uh, but you don't want to be attacked while you're using it anyway. And arm to the teeth gives you an extra weapon set. You basically don't really need that because with the druid you're just going to be using your spells or your spirit shift form in the main rather than using conventional weapons so I wouldn't recommend uh, the island of Mawa. So here is our completed druid. Now before I level up the druid and discuss talents and spells I actually want to discuss the subtle differences between the druidic spirit shift creatures that you can choose from. So I've actually created not just one druid but five druids and each and every one of these has a different spirit shift creature so if I turn the head back on and enter the character screen you can see here that each and every one of these druids has exactly the same attribute so this should be a fair example in theory uh, so let's actually uh, grab the wolf uh, druids and I actually need to enter combat before I can show off these creature types as you can see here it mentions combat only so let's move over to this part of the map and there's actually some uh, wolves over here as it happens and uh, that means combat has been engaged let's run back over here okay they should follow yep right so let's uh, actually spirit shift so wolf stag cat boar and of course bear yeah. so there they all are and they're druidic Creature glory, I guess, would be the word for it. Uh, so I'm not really going to do much combat here. I uh, just discuss the differences. So probably the best way to do that is actually by entering the inventory screen first of all, so we can see them a bit uh, closer up. Now you can see here that they have weapon sets, and they're all very similar. They're basically appendages or teeth or whatever of uh, the creature types. Uh, so they actually have different types of attack though some of them so I believe three of them are pierce damage the wolf the uh, stag and the boar and the other two are slash now to be honest it's not a big difference between the damage types arguably pierce is a tiny bit better or at least it was before the white match came out uh, the game might have been balanced a bit more now um, slash tends to work against very unarmored opponents uh, so I tend to prefer Pierce. Uh, if we actually take a look at any of these weapon types in a bit more detail, or just hover over there, you can see they're unarmed, one-handed, speed average, they've got average interrupt. They do a hefty amount of damage, and that's modified, of course, by your might. And this actually levels up during the course of the game as well. So the very high-level uh, druids will have a huge amount of damage when they turn into a, a creature type. They have 5 DR Bypass, so that works against armoured uh, opponents, which is nice. I don't believe that levels up, though. They actually gain accuracy boosts during the course of the game as well, when they level up. I'm going to show you a druid later on that I've completely levelled up, and I'll show you the differences between them. Uh, so, they're t not too accurate, actually, the druids with the creature types, so they actually miss a lot, but... Uh, they do a lot of damage when they connect. If you have high perception, of course, though, you'll do more damage in combat. 
Uh, so if I'm going to show off all of the differences between the creatures, I should probably come out of this screen. Uh, let's first of all have a look at the stag. So you can see here there's one per encounter, its speed is instant which is fantastic. The duration is modified by intelligence of course and there's some details here. So in the stag's case they have extra defenses and they have carnage attack. The carnage attack is one per rest and this works in a very similar way to the barbarian's carnage attack. But to be honest in my experience it isn't all that great so I'm going to show that in a second. Uh, the defenses that the stag gets you can see uh, down here all of the defense types. It looks as if the plus seven extra in each and every category compared to the other uh, creature types. So it's not an amazing bonus to be honest for the stag. Stag's probably the creature type I like the least. Uh, so that's why I started with them basically get them out of the way. So let's slow down combat. Let's go I'm around here. here. Uh, let's tell a cat not to actually attack that wolf or it's going to kill it pretty quickly. Uh, so let's come over here. I'm here. Okay, and engage there. I can engage there. I'm here. Right. So if I get the stack to use this uh, carnage attack, uh, you can see here that the damage amount is pretty tiny, but that's probably in addition to your normal attack. And the range is crap as well. So this is nowhere near as good as the barbarian's ability. Uh, but we'll see in an action anyway. So you can see the that it did, well it actually hit that one then and hit that one which is a surprise since the accuracy isn't great at this level. Uh, this lasts supposedly for 30 seconds so maybe I'm being a bit unfair on the carnage attack for the stag but I think in previous patches it hasn't worked well maybe it's working properly now. Uh, so moving on to a different creature uh, let's check out the boar next is it? So the boar has an ability to regenerate endurance, which I'm not actually sure when that kicks in, probably half endurance I'm guessing. Uh, so this might be better for more melee orientated uh, druid builds than I've created here. Uh, perhaps ones that have a bit more constitution and maybe even resolve if uh, perhaps uh, there aren't many druid builds that I would want resolve with. Uh, they also have, uh, if I go back into the inventory screen, the ability to uh, do wounding damage. So it's an extra 20% damage inflicted over time, 5 seconds. So they're pretty good for melee orientated druids that are frequently trying to get into combat uh, with the uh, spirit shift creature form and not too worried about being attacked while in combat as well. Uh, moving on, uh, the next one we'll look at is the... Uh, Spirit Shift Beer. So they have an ability to frighten opponents. They have a terrifying roar. It should be a frightening roar because it doesn't actually do terror. Uh, it's just frighten. Uh, that's to rest, average speed. Radius, you can see here, is affected by intelligence. Uh, yet another thing intelligence is good for. To be honest, this is pretty good early on in the game. But by the late game, a lot of your party members will probably have the ability to frighten opponents I imagine so it's not so great then but something which is very good with the beer that lasts uh, throughout the game is that they have very good damage reduction they actually have the best out of all of the creature types all the others are eight to start out I believe this levels up with every level as well so this uh, gets uh, better over the course of the game so this is great for uh, well quite uh, Fragile druids like the build I've created, ones that are more focused on doing damage and keeping away from the action. So this is very good late game when you're just using spells more so than your actual creature ability usually. Uh, early game when you don't have many spells you're going to be using the creature ability more to do damage with the druid. Uh, so moving on, the next uh, creature type is the cat. Now the cat has naturally fast attacks and can burst into to even faster attacks for a short period of time. Cat is the build which is uh, great for damage. If you want to do a ton of damage while in melee, I'd go for this one more so than any other. But it doesn't have any defensive uh, boosts or anything other than just pure damage. But uh, very good in the early game. And the last creature type, which may be my favorite, uh, is the Spirit Shift Wolf. So the Spirit Shift Wolf actually moves quicker 
than the other spirit shift creatures supposedly and it also has an ability to knock opponents prone so this is kind of works like a get out of jail card almost for the druid if your druid gets into too much trouble you can try and use this uh, knockdown ability to knock an opponent down and then run off uh, somewhere very quickly uh, to get out of trouble or you could use it to uh, perhaps say you had a, a party member like a a wizard or a priest that was getting into a lot of trouble, you could use the druid to use this to uh, get them out of melee combat. So that's got quite a few uses. All in all, I'd say the differences between the creature types are very subtle. I wouldn't say any is much stronger than any of the others, but yeah, you may uh, want to pick your creature based on some of the uh, differences that I've highlighted. So here is our druid in very druidic apparel. So I'm going to be discussing talents now while I level up our character. You can basically go in about three or so different directions when leveling up and picking talents with your druid. Uh, the first of those is basically to maximize your spirit shift ability. Uh, you can do that by picking these wild strike uh, talents. They all give you extra damage, fire, elemental effects, a burn, corrode, freeze and shock. Uh, you can only pick uh, or go in one direction with these uh, those so you can't like pick shock and corrode or freeze and shock for example uh, there are two talents for the wild strike abilities and you can also level up your creature in other ways by picking more offensive talents that give them extra damage in one way or another or even something like uh, the apprentice's sneak attack uh, other than that you can go for a more conventional weapons type focus by picking one of the focuses like peasant for example and uh, using hunting bows or perhaps a hatchet and a shield in combat uh, so that's uh, one route you can take the other route you can take is by picking extra spells which you can get later on when you level up a bit I'll show those in a second now one thing I should mention that's very important is that you're now able to respec your characters so basically, uh, this has been added in White March. You can go to an inn or your player home, for example, spend a bit of money and completely choose uh, all of your talents over again and attributes. So if you do make a mistake when you're picking your talents, uh, it doesn't matter because all you need to do is uh, do that, respec, and uh, that mistake goes away. Uh, this adds a lot of flexibility when creating your characters and it's very useful, especially for the druid, because early on in the game, uh, certain, well, the spirit shift ability and conventional attacks you tend to use a lot more, while as later on in the game you may be using your spells a lot more often, as uh, so you may want to respect because of that. So let's pick one of these wild strike abilities. They're all different elemental damages. I wouldn't say that any is particularly a lot stronger than any of the others. You could argue that maybe corrode and shock is a bit better than the other two because less opponents have resistances to those in theory. Uh, so I'm actually going to pick freeze though. Uh, let's just pick that one. So let's uh, go next. It kind of goes along with the wolf uh, theme, I guess. Uh, so let's uh, next again. I'm going to discuss skills later on. You get extra spells uh, every couple of levels, and I'll be discussing spells also later on. So let's uh, move on here. So let's get the second wild strike ability. Uh, you can see also now that the extra bonus. Uh, for spells comes in at this level. There are four of these in total that you can choose from. Uh, so here you get an extra first level spell. So these are pretty good. But I'm going to be picking that again. Now if you are going along the uh, creature uh, route, so to speak, picking all of these wild strike abilities, one talent that's very good uh, are the utility talents for uh, elemental damage so that's sign of flame heart of the storm spirit of decay and secrets of rhyme and this one would be particularly good for my character because we've picked extra freeze damage from our wild strike ability so I'm gonna pick that here also the spells are affected by this as well there are uh, basically elemental spells for each and every elemental type so if you do like certain spells over another then maybe you should highly consider picking one of these talents uh, so my free spells would be a lot better in this uh, scenario here and moving on again yet more spells you can see here that, that uh, that's a freeze one as well 
so that would gain extra damage with that talent I've just picked. Now if you didn't want to go, well actually let's uh, mention, since I've been leveling up mainly our creature abilities here I should mention something to go along well with the creature. So bloody slaughter might be pretty good for the creature type and spells as well. Uh, vulnerable attack works for the creature. Uh, that does extra DR bypass, so this would be great against uh, heavy armored opponents. Uh, savage attack is another that you could arguably consider, but your accuracy is pretty dodgy with your creature type, so maybe you wouldn't want to take that one. So there's a few different talents here that go would uh, enhance your spirit shift form if uh, this is the direction you would want to take. If uh, you don't want to go for a more uh, spirit shift focused uh, druid character though, and for this build I actually think that that may not be the best uh, route to take since your constitution and resolve are so low. You may want to go for more conventional uh, weapon boosts for your talents early on with your druid. So picking something like the peasant focus to use, get a bonus out of your hunting bow. Uh, you can have a hatchet and shield which would help out here. And then what else could you pick? You could pick marks one to get more out of your bow. You could get penetrating shot to get extra DR bypass with your hunting bow. That's the direction you may want to take. You may even want to go for a quarter staff uh, with your druid. All of these other weapon focuses you might want to go for, but the peasant is probably my favourite with the druid. Uh, what else have we got in here that might be worthwhile? I'm not sure if the two-handed, not two-handed, two weapon style actually works with the spirit shift form. It's kind of difficult to figure out if it's quicker or not. You'd have to experiment with that to find out. I haven't been able to find out myself. Uh, yeah, so there's quite a few different picks you can pick here. Uh, out of the defensive picks, late game, perhaps even early game, you may even want to consider some of the more defensive picks. Uh, so you could have a shield and hatchet perhaps. Uh, have cautious attack, uh, weapon and shield, superior deflection if you're worried about your uh, druid getting in a lot of trouble. This may be even a good idea to respec into in, in the late game if you're not using your creature type so much or even your conventional attacks. So that's something you could, should uh, perhaps consider at some point. Deep pockets might be a pretty good pick. I'll discuss skills a bit later on though. Depends how, well, how you invest your skills really. Uh, what else have we got? Yeah, I think I've discussed most of those. Uh, the class type, we've got all of these extra spells. Again, let's uh, pick that one here, is it? Okay, and the next level, more spells. At level 9, you get extra per encounter use instead of per rest for your level 1 spells. So this is when your druid really, really becomes very powerful. And your spells really take over as your main form of attack rather than conventional weapons or your animal. Uh, let's just level up again. Get a fourth level here. Let's pick the second one though. Uh, level up again. At uh, this level, level two become per encounter use. Let's level up again. Now you don't get a fifth level spell sadly for some reason. I should mention all of these new hybrid talents. Uh, basically you have 10 to choose from here, you can't actually pick the druids one because you're a druid. I've actually did a video on all of these talents that were added in the White March, which you may want to check out. I'll leave a link to that at the end of the video. Some of these would be pretty good for this druid build and some of them not so good. This one's a very good one that I would definitely take with the druid at some point. So this allows your druid to get extra damage against opponents that are afflicted by any of these afflictions and many of your spell types actually do these afflictions so this is a great way for your druid to do extra damage and I'd pick this for no matter uh, what direction you take with your talents pretty much at some point. Uh, also within the first couple of seconds of combat that works. The other talents that I might consider with the druid, Gallant's Focus, if you don't happen to have a paladin with the zealous focus within your party. I'd highly consider this with a druid because your druid has such high intelligence. This actually modifies the aura range, although it doesn't mention it here. 
So I definitely consider picking that. And what else? Uh, if you go for more of a conventional weapons approach with your druids, runners, wounded shot might be pretty good, especially with a, a bow uh, focused druid. That's one that's not too bad. The other ones, veterans recovery might be okay for a more melee focused druid build with extra constitution and perhaps even resolve. Yeah, I don't think the other ones are particularly good. The unarmed one doesn't work with your creature uh, claws or teeth or whatever. I've uh, tried it out and I couldn't get it to work the extra accuracy or the unarmed damage, sadly. So I think I've pretty much picked everything I want to pick here, though, and discuss the talents as much as I wanted to do. So let's... I think I've got one more level to do. More spells there again. Level 3 spells now per encounter. So let's discuss skills now. The White March expansion actually added a couple of extra levels. So you now have a huge amount of skill points to invest. And also because you have a respec ability added in the game, it's not so important to get this right initially. Uh, you can just spend some money and uh, mis uh, correct any mistakes that you've made if you do make any mistakes. What I would say though when it comes to skills, the most important decision you'll make is uh, picking your background initially. Now, say for example here, I wanted to raise a stat to a rank of 10. If you start out with a rank of 0, that's going to cost you a lot of skill points. That's 55. Whereas, if I pick the right background in the skill that I wanted to invest in, uh, in this example, I've put, uh, I chose Colonist to get an extra couple of points in survival. This will only cost me 21 points. So it's massively cheaper uh, so if you do pick the right background, that will save you a lot of points to invest in other areas. And you do need to get that correct because you can't respect that. So in this case with the Druid, because we have very high levels of might and intelligence, that really works well for lore, mechanics and survival. They all benefit from that. Uh, so with survival, that's better for more defensive situations, although it has the odd uh, offensive... Uh, potion I believe and some food will help uh, for more offensive scenarios as well so I tend to pick this with a druid but you can definitely make a case for lore to be honest with lore though it's mainly scrolls and a lot of the scrolls the druid actually has the spells for already uh, there are a lot of wizard spells the ones that may be the most useful for the druids are arguably the priest uh, scrolls uh, the prayer against ones uh, in particular if you don't happen to have a priest within your party you may perhaps want to invest in lore to a certain degree. Uh, other than that, you could maybe invest in mechanics, but you just don't start with any points, so I'm not a big fan of doing that. Uh, I'd invest in athletics with every character you have, definitely at least level 3, and in many cases, especially for frontline characters, a lot more. Uh, maybe 7 points, and the rest into stealth, I think, and a point in lore. That's probably what I would do uh, with my druid build here. Stealth is particularly useful if you want to cast a spell at the start of combat. You could sneak up on an opponent and use an area of effect spell, for example. I'll discuss more about spells later on, though. There are downsides about uh, actually initiating combat with your druid. Because your druid is quite uh, vulnerable to attacks, uh, it's not exactly a frontline build. Uh, if you get targeted, by uh, long range opponents with bows or guns for example or spell casters you could get yourself in a lot of trouble so it's best to use spells at the start of combat against uh, melee only opponents perhaps with the druid. So like all spell casters the most important thing about the druid are their spells. You can see here that this is a completely leveled up druid and we have a vast variety of spells to choose from. There's got to be about 50 spells maybe here now I'm not going to go through each and every one of these individually because it would just take too long. This video would end up being an hour if not two hours long. Uh, so I'm going to talk about them in more broad categories. Before I do that though, let's quickly dip into the character sheet. You can see that this completely leveled up, level 14 druid. has gone for a more of a spell focus. We've got extra spells here. Not necessarily what I'd go for, but since we're showing off spells, I thought that's what I should do. Now, let's start out by showing the first three levels here. By the end of the game, all of these are now per encounter. So in this case, we've actually got 15 per encounter uh, or per engagement spells to use uh, every single combat we get ourselves into. All of the other spells are still per rest. So if you do use them, you would have to 
uh, take a nap at the campsite or an inn to get the uh, spells back. Basically, if I, uh, for example, were to cast uh, not Sunlands because I need to do it on opponent. Let's do that one. Uh, 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 yeah, you can see that's gone down one spell here now because that's per rest use. Now, the Druid has a vast variety of spells to cast, as I mentioned. Uh, they all have different types. They're very, very versatile compared to Wizards, for example. Wizards mainly focus on uh, personal buffs and just uh, normal uh, damaging spells over a large area of, area of effect, which is similar to the Druid. But the Druid also has spells that can heal uh, party members or even protect party members, unlike the Wizard. Uh, which comes in very handy, so they're much more versatile. But the Druid's real strength is actually just doing huge amount of damage over a large area of effects. So uh, spells like uh, Winter Wind, which is the Atone spell, our intelligence is, is improving all of these. That is Sunbeam. Many of these spells happen to be have elemental effects, so they do burn damage, freeze damage, shock damage, and corrode damage, of course. Uh, they have a lot of afflictions associated with many of their spells. Uh, some of them do elemental and afflictions, uh, like blinded in that case there. Now, what I'd say with the druid is certain spells are very good to start out combat with. Uh, Tanglefoot, for example, causes hobbled over a very large area and for a very large amount of time, uh, based on your uh, intelligence, of course. Uh, so if you do cast spells on opponents like that, you can basically lower their stats, like Reflex, for example, in that case. Or even you could use a spell like uh, Nature's Vigor. Uh, Nature's uh, Vigor is a bit similar. That's Deflection and Reflex. You start out with spells like that, and then you can use your vast variety of other spells uh, that will now have a bigger chance to hit uh, if they target, say, Reflex, for example, with those two spells. Uh, you have some deflection spells in here as well. The druid also has the old spell, which is a personal buff. That gives you a uh, firebrand uh, sword, I believe. That's very useful in certain circumstances. They also have these, uh, if I can find it, uh, conjure spells. So you can conjure a creature. So they're very useful if you get swamped by more opponents than you can handle, or perhaps your front line's a bit low on health, so you want to uh, conjure someone to take all of the damage. Uh, they have the odd weird spell like Twin Stones, which has a really weird template. Uh, uh, so they have a massive variety of spells. They have spells that are good against beasts in particular. They have at least a couple of those. Yeah, so I'd say the Druid is probably the most versatile spellcaster, arguably. Definitely more versatile than the Wizard. And uh, it's much more damaging than the Priest, but arguably it's more versatile than them as well. They even have a defense against spell, in this case against uh, poison and disease. Not too many of those spell types, but uh, yeah, definitely at least one in there. So Druids are pretty amazing when it comes to spells. Yes. Uh, yeah. So by the end of the game, this is probably all you'll be doing is casting spells rather than using conventional attacks. And maybe even not using the spirit shift form all that much either. Now I mentioned, I'm I believe, here. that I was going to show off the leveled up spirit shift uh, ability before the end of the video. So let's do that now. Let's spirit shift into the wolf and check out the inventory. So you can see here that the damage reduction has gone up double, I think, from the early game. Also the damage that the... Uh, creatures, appendages do teeth in this instance uh, basically have increased quite significantly as well as a huge amount of damage. And I'll be showing off the wolf in the combat demo in a minute. And also they have a huge accuracy boost as well uh, by the end of the game. Sadly the DR bypass hasn't gone up but you can't have everything. So that basically concludes this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have, please help me out by giving this video a like. I'm really grateful to those of you who do that as it boosts my videos in YouTube search ranking so people can actually find the videos in the first place. Uh, you may even have used the search feature to find this video yourself. So uh, in effect, you'll be helping other people like yourself. Also, if you uh, happen to really enjoy the video and want to share it with someone, please do so. That helps me out also. If you have any comments or questions about this video, please use the comment section or any requests for future content. I respond to questions left on the channel no matter how old a video is. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, you may want to consider doing so. 
Uh, there's plenty more content for uh, Pillars of Eternity the White Match coming on the channel. In fact, there's a huge playlist with plenty more videos like this that you may want so to check out. Uh, there's a link to that I'll leave in the comment section and also as an annotation. Uh, so there's plenty more build videos and some videos that I've released since the White Match came out uh, mentioning things that have changed like attributes and also all of the new hybrid talents. Uh, also, apart from subscribing, uh, you may want to consider becoming a Patreon of mine if you really enjoy my videos and you fancy helping out. Uh, basically, the money that YouTubers get from Google is less than ever, uh, probably because of ad block, I imagine. So if you can help out in any way, please check out my Patreon page. There's a link to that in the comments section and also on the homepage. Uh, basically, just affording the games to feature on the channel is a bit of a problem at the moment for me. So. Uh, if you can become a patron of mine, uh, if you have the disposable income, please consider doing so. Right, so I believe that covers oh, just about cool everything I in. wanted to cover, so I'd just like to thank you for watching again, and I'll see you next time. As you wish.